welcome, welcome everybody to this, our last cafe of the season, um, 16th season for Archaeology Cafes. This is the eighth and the final, final one in this series. I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, um, one of the first things I would like to just point out is that, um, you know, we're, we're here in Archaeology, Archaeology Southwest is here in Tucson, Arizona, this is our headquarters. And um, we're based here in Tucson, and this is also the homeland of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the Pascuayaki tribe. And, you know, even though our offices are here in Tucson, we work across the Southwest, the present day American Southwest, and um, the entirety of that area and actually all of the Americas um, comprises the homelands of indigenous peoples for time immemorial, for millennial, millennium. So um, just wanted to ask everyone to think about that, maybe consider, consider learning more about the, um, the folk whose homelands you're living on these days um, across the country. Um, it's an interesting chance to learn a little bit about our, our history. I also wanted to acknowledge and thank very much the Smith Living Trust. They have once again sponsored this season and, and helped really make it possible. So Eldon, Jean, and Jay Smith just wanted to say thank you again so much for all your support of this public programming. It is appreciated and, and makes a real difference. So thank you. Yeah, and so on that, I want to just introduce um, our speaker tonight, who is Wade Campbell. Wade is an assistant professor of archaeology and anthropology at Boston University. Yes, I think I have that right. <laughs> um, Wade is also a Diné um, archaeologist, and his research examines, um, you know, relationships between Diné communities and, and other groups in, in the um, U.S. Southwest. Um, I'm going to let him say more about himself. He can share whatever he'd like to about himself and let him just get into his presentation tonight, which is entitled Collaborating with Diné Communities. So we're interested in seeing what, um, what you have to tell us of, on that topic. So I'll turn this over to you, Wade. You can share screen and take it away. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Sarah. All right, let's see if I can, it's been three years. I should be able to do this. Uh, okay, um, well, got a welcome. Shay Wade Campbell in a share, Kia Ani Nishla, Billy Gunner, Bushes Chin, Paul Hunter Dush and Chail, the Billy Gunner Dush and Miller, Kits Ely Dan Nasha, Ado Boston University, Dinesh Nish. For all the rest of you that aren't Avaho, welcome. Um, as, as Linda noted, I am a relatively newly minted assistant professor here at Boston University. Um, it is actually 9 p.m. here, and uh, I while well, I would love to be there in person in some Mexican restaurant in Tucson, talking with you all, we'll have to settle for this. Um, but it, it is truly an honor to, to back clean up for this 16th season of um, the Archaeology Cafe series. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, or at least share some of my thoughts with you about today, isn't about sheep, uh, which might come as a surprise to some of you who know me and know a lot of the work I've been involved with um, more recently, um, as well as those of you who may have seen some of the Archaeology Southwest promotional materials, which had strategically paced sheep in the background of some of the images. I am not going to be talking that much, uh, very little actually, about uh, the nest sheep herding in the four corners. Um, instead, this is going to be more presentation about ideas and the power of ideas um, and frameworks and such. And it is something that I've thought about for a while, but really took off for me when I started uh, working on um, a uh, archaeology Southwest project uh, at Chaco at Chaco Canyon, um, along with uh, Paul Reed, looking at the, the Navajo cultural landscape of the park. Um, those ideas uh, kind of bubbled and fomented. And over the past few months, I've tried to investigate them in the field, as well as think more critically about what they might mean. And, and um, I want to have a, sh a shout out today is the last day of class here at, at or my last class day here um, this semester at BU. Um, and this semester I was teaching an indigenous archaeology class. And 
some of the things that I'm going to sort of present to you here today are very much tied to things that I was able to uh, kind of co-create and think through with a, a really bright group of students that, that give me some hope for uh, the future of archaeology. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get stuck in. Um, the title of my talk is Collaborating with the Net Communities, but perhaps more accurately, it's Thinking Outside the Pueblito Box. Um, and what is a pueblito? Well, to give you a rundown of what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll introduce what a pueblito is for those of you that aren't uh, up to your neck in sort of Navajo archaeology terms. Um, I'm going to talk about what it, how it's uh, linked to just Navajo archaeology in general, as well as this larger history of anthropological, archaeological, historical thought regarding the net people in the Southwest. Um, and then I am going to try to challenge that thinking and argue for a, a, uh, a recasting of Pueblitos, both archeologically and more conceptually um, with a lens towards looking to the future for sort of Navajo studies in general, but also, or discussions of Navajo history in general, um, but Navajo archeology span in particular. Uh, on the right, or on my right, you're right, somebody's right, what you'll see is a map of the four corners showing a couple of the areas I'm gonna kind of be referencing throughout uh, tonight's talk, including in the red, uh, the outlines of modern day Navajo nation, um, as well as a couple key areas. You know, I'll make some references to Spanish colonial New Mexico, and that's really the Rio Grande River Valley um, in New Mexico, sort of Santa Fe, Albuquerque, uh, as well as an area that's called the Netra, which is the traditional Navajo homelands, which are now centered on the kind of upper San Juan um, in Northwest New Mexico. Um, and it's an area that's actually off the reservation today, but it holds a very important place within the um, uh, cultural teachings and history of, of the Net people. So without further ado, um, what exactly is a Pueblito and why you, yes, you Zoom listener might want to um, have some interest. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words unless you're writing an essay for a class. So I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures to kind of illustrate the point. Um, Pueblitos. These are Pueblitos. This is a site known as the Citadel in Largo Canyon. This is a, another well-known Navajo Pueblito called Three Corn. This is Francis Canyon Ruin. Um, this is not just a mesa, but it's actually the impressive site known as Shaft House. This is Old Fort, a collection you know, of massive kind of walled uh, settlement here with a fortified entryway on the mesa edge. And then in the back here, you have fork stick, uh, kind of the old style Navajo hogans within these courtyards. And I want to highlight them in part because uh, Pueblitos are at their core um, really fascinating sites. They're mainly defensive in nature, um, and a lot are quite imposing, as you've seen with these sort of four. Um, often multi-storied, um, stone masonry, um, defensively situated, uh, and they can also take other forms as well, smaller sort of units that are tucked away up on mesa tops or boulder tops. This is a the Simone Canyon Pueblito uh, near the San Juan River, uh, near the Quality Waters. This boulder is almost two stories tall, and it's a single little room on top. They take a lot of forms, um, and they're not always as imposing as the others, right? You can have these single uh, or two, three, one, two, three, four room boulder top constructions that are often associated with other types of architecture. You can see here where my cursor is moving. Um, you can see the outlines of a stone foundation associated with this uh, pueblito. They're, like I said, highly defensive. And in some cases, the defensive nature isn't just sort of the imposing quality of the masonry um, and the position, but also sometimes they're, they're defensive in that they're hidden. This is a Harmio Canyon ruin um, in Denetra. And as you can see, like if, you, you, if you're traveling down the main valley, which is out here, you have a very brief window from which you can actually spot this uh, this structure. And it speaks to the Pueblito's roles as uh, areas of refuge and safety for Navajo communities 
um, in the period prior to the long walk in the Deneto region. Um, some, you know, talking about sort of imposing nature versus less imposing nature, you know, many of them were actually essentially semi ruined or, or crumbled here, like uh, the uh, pipeline Plebuito. Um, others, still others, aren't actually structures at all, but actually naturally, uh, naturally defensive landforms like Santos Peak or this, um, this isolated mesa finger here. In some cases, they're augmented with um, certain features like walls or uh, ammo caches or, or carefully situated um, watchtowers that guard points of access. Um, but as a whole, both these structures and the, the more general class of sort of defensive site are all associated with uh, a larger assortment of early Navajo archaeological sites, including habitation sites and also special activity sites. And the habitation sites are distinguished by the presence of these types of structures here. Um, first and foremost, they're fork-sticked hogans, um, the most readily identified uh, kind of early Navajo um, habitation structure. This is a, a modern example of one that's at the Navajo Nation Zoo now actually, and but it gives you a sense that basically uh, sort of sticks piled into a conical shape with usually with an entryway that are covered in brush and bark and earth um, to make them uh, more secure. And over time, when they uh, sort of decay and, and return back to the earth, they tend to collapse downward after the edges kind of weaken, resulting in a characteristic kind of starburst or asterisk pattern. Um, and in and of themselves, it's really interesting, right? Because they contrast really greatly with the Pueblitos, you know, this sort of very low visibility in archeological sort of terms, right? These low visibility structures. Um, that are often contrasted with the uh, sort of high visibility or easily seen um, masonry uh, walls or, or rubble mounds that define the Pueblitos. Um, and at, at both types of sites, we find a variety of really kind of quintessential early Navajo material cultural uh, material culture remains, including evidence of early uh, Navajo subsistence practices in the form of both maize and uh, maize agriculture and other types of hunting, including, um, you know, classic Southwestern uh, animals like deer and small game, as well as eventually once we reach the 17th and 18th centuries, um, Western domesticates, particularly sheep and goat, as well as maybe cattle, but uh, definitely horse or mule. Um, also, you know, culturally modified trees and architectural timbers as well as signs of economic activity, like um, the production of tools from obsidian, which is coming from different place, points across the Southwest, as well as kind of quintessential Navajo ceramic types. Um, the plainware, which is known as Dineto Gray, and in its complete form is distinguished by uh, sort of a conical or a pointed base. Um, and uh, the governor, the, uh, a type, a painted pottery type known as Govindor polychrome, which is um, quite distinctive in part because it's often extremely high, highly fired or in, in nearly vitrified and um, has kind of wonky characteristics, one might say. There's often bubbling or slumping or spalling of the uh, ceramics after, um, after they've been on the surface for some time. So as a whole, right, that's just an example, at least a kind of uh, both uh, Pueblitos, but then other types of Navajo material culture, just to give you a sense of things. And with that in mind, um, Pueblitos in, in terms of the archeology span of, of early Navajo history in the Southwest are really important because, well, first and foremost, they're the first Dines sites that were encountered and discussed in depth by early Southwest archeologists, including folks like A.V. Kidder, um, Earl Morris, Dorothy Kerr. Um, we now know that there are, oh, 145 or so concentrated in Donetska, this, this area in the upper San Juan that's often referred to as the Largo Gobernador area. Um, and it's the, like I said, the ancestral Donet homeland located between Herfano um, Peak, on US 550, and Cholen, or Gobernador Knob, which is on a ridge uh, 
to the east of, of the Netta out here. Um, and since the early 20th century, the turn of the 20th century, um, the material relationships that I kind of laid out to you just now through these photographs, early archeologists observed them at these defensive sites. And the way they thought about what those different types of material culture met, uh, meant came to define thinking about early Navajo archeology span um, and by extent, early Navajo history, uh, really throughout the 20th century and, and to some uh, degree into the present day. Um, and within this, right, I want to specify that the term Pueblito is an archaeological term. Um, it was coined by the archaeologist Dorothy Kerr when she was working in Donetska in the late 30s and early 40s. Um, and it was the term that Hispanic homesteaders, 1920s, 1930s Hispanic homesteaders in the region uh, used to refer to these sites that were on the landscape and that they were encountering when they were out um, herding sheep and cattle and, and, and attempting to kind of um, prove up their homesteads during this time. So with that in mind, I think the, the next point to make, right, is that pueblitos are a key part of Navajo archaeology not only because they're really noticeable and they have a long history of interaction, but as I said, that the way archeologists understood what they saw at Pueblito sites has structured the way that we have come to talk about and think about Navajo's place in the Southwest for the past hundred years, more or less. Um, and in this, um, I apologize for the wall of text. Um, but the bolded some of these high points from A.V. Kidder's brief report about traveling to these ruins in the early 19 teens. Um, and as he points out, right, the first point that he, he made was that the, uh, these ruins are historic. Uh, they have ax cut, ax cut marks on the timbers and that at a lot of them, you can clearly see typical Navajo hogans, these earth colored lodges. And he postulated that there were two explanations. One, that the creators of the Pueblitos were from that area and that had gained all these associated materials from other folks who traded them to them. Or the second idea, that they were built by people who came from elsewhere, from the South, and he specified that they were part of the Pueblos. Um, he discounted the first idea that it was you know, local folks to the region that, that brought them. Uh, that were responsible for this and instead uh, ran with the idea that Pueblo refugees, people fleeing the, um, the post Pueblo revolt reconquest of New Mexico by um, Don Diego de Vargas in the 1690s had come to this area and with them had basically brought the ability and know-how to construct these dwellings. And this idea was picked up by other archeologists at the time, most no notably the uh, archeologist Dorothy Kerr who did work at both Big Bead Mesa in the Rio Puerco Basin, as well as in the Neta proper. And she was very much interested in the kind of up and coming topic of the time, which was, uh, or anthropological topic, I should say, which was acculturation. In particular, she was trying to understand uh, how those elements of Navajo culture she thought of as Puebloan uh, were how they came to be. And um, again, like Kidder, she understood these processes to be the result of Pueblo refugees fleeing the reconquest and living with Navajo people in the in these regions, in the Rio Puerco and in Doneta, um, and bringing with them all the kind of know-how and, and um, uh, all, all the know-how to create these structures and also by association, uh, painted pottery and ceremonial practices and the like. And so in, in summary, right, this, this idea that there was this kind of unidirectional cultural transfer of Southwestern or Puebloan cultural traits from Pueblo peoples to Dinette peoples in the 1690s came to be known as um, the Pueblo refugee hypothesis. And it's interesting because this idea that was coined in the you know early mid 1900s um, still persists to this day. In part, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons, and I'll get into them now. 
Um, one of the reasons that you can sort of see on the left here is that uh, researchers, early anthropologists and social scientists that wanted to work um, with or study Navajo people during the mid to late 20th century were engaging with the research of Kerr and others as, as their main lens into Navajo history. And they thus took the, these, these published results from the, archeolo uh, from the archeologists and incorporated them into their own studies. And I think you see this really well in Club Colin and Lighten's uh, piece uh, or book, um, The Navajo, which was originally published in 1946 and has been reprinted many times since then. Um, and if you go to any used bookstore in Boston or Tucson or where have you, the odds are actually quite good that you'll come across one or another copy of 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 uh, Clark Cohen and Lighten's piece, and, and Clark Cohen in particular sort of achieved a status as a kind of noted expert on Navajo anthropology and Navajo culture and ceremonies. Um, but it's interesting that to think that he had this status, yet at least viewed Navajo people as essentially being. Um, borrowers of of those traits that kind of tie them to the southwest in particular they were they were really strongly influenced by um or overemphasized the importance of 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 language but as this exchange right now can show you language is fluid language is malleable we're talking in english not navajo not spanish not anything else and so um these assertions about you know sort of simple cultures being enriched by others, namely Pueblo cultures, is one that's been sort of hard to shake. And since the 30s and 40s has been readily encountered and reprint, reprinted and reprinted uh, and restated by researchers working in the Southwest. And one of the things that's really interesting is that this overall focus has started is starting to be critiqued by um, the current generation of Southwestern scholars or folks of the previous generation who were kind of iconoclasts and now feel that they have nothing to lose, including probably, uh, at least in terms of readability, uh, Steve Lexon, who is in his study, his um, 2018 book, The Study of Southwestern Archaeology, has pointed out that a lot of Southwestern archaeology is inherently structured around an engagement with a kind of archaeological construct that is Pueblo space. And to quote, right, every Everything in the past must be Pueblo, Puebloish, or leading logically to modern Pueblos. And this bias comes from a variety of causes, um, in part because archaeology has its roots in this early 20th century moment. Um, people really held up Pueblo cultures, Pueblo communities, which are you know an assortment of different um, groups, to be some sort of uh, strange cultural exemplar. And you know, you look at folks like Ruth Benedict and her book Patterns of Culture, right? Holding up Zuni as the quintessential embodiment of Apollonian uh, of characteristics, right? The people, she, she, there's a statement in that book that says, uh, you know, that primitive cultures are the perfect laboratory to understand uh, early human society. There was, I think, at its core, a lot of issues with those early approaches that we've kind of held on to. And the assumption that uh, like uncritical sort of applications of a sort of Pueblo mystique, a Pueblo imaginary, Pueblo space to, to quote Lexan is something that has kind of hampered us. And, and before you log off the Zoom and, and you know, head somewhere else, you know, it's worth noting that these are, are things that aren't just academic discussions. They're things that extend out into kind of the everyday world. People read these books, people come to these talks um, and engage with it in their own ways. This is a, when I was putting this talk together, I was kind of curious and, and started poking around and I found this website, which is from an art dealer. So there's perhaps several caveats that need to be taken, but this individual is selling what appears to be a Gobernador polychrome pot with really no provenience other than coming from the Gobernador area. Um, but if you read the, the descriptions, they're, they're firmly rooted in this sense of uh, Pueblo refugees bringing their knowledge to 
people on the outskirts of the Southwestern world. Um, and it is firmly rooted to the concept of the Pueblito. If you look on the upper right, right, this bowl could essentially hold enough food to feed an entire Pueblito, unquote, right? Um, and uh, <laughs> it ends, of course, with, uh, you know, price available upon request. The, the, the narrative that I've, you know, tried to outline for you is still active and it's only now starting to change. And what I'd like to sort of put forward today is sort of why I think that these ideas um, should change and ways in which they are being done and how as researchers and other archeologically curious people, we can kind of um, hasten the process of, of thinking more critically about the Southwestern past as it relates to Navajo people in this specific case, but also more broadly in terms of intertribal or you know, inter-community interactions throughout the Southwest over much longer spans of time. And so within that, um, let's sort of pivot now. I've tried to outline at least my <laughs> straw man, paper man, um, but let's think about rethinking Pueblitos. How is this being done? How can it be done? And so I think the first part of this is associated with archeology span proper, right? Starting in the uh, 1980s, there was really an explosion of Navajo archeology span related work in Northwest New Mexico and, and elsewhere. Um, and it, it comes on the heels of actually a, a long hiatus, really once, once Dorothy Kerr finished her work um, before World War II, uh, Navajo archaeology work in general kind of hit a, a lull. There wasn't a lot of engagement with it. People went in other directions. Chaco, Hohokam world, other sorts of questions attracted a lot of interest. But starting in the in the late '80s, this this uh, natural gas boom in Dineta um, triggered a lot of CRM work, and that's what you can see in the in this image here. This is a satellite image of Dineta. Largo's to the left, Gobernadores to the right. Uh, the San Juan is just visible on the upper left. And all those little tiny dots, little pimples on the face of a really holy place are natural gas wells and gas roads that um, are, are spread across the region. And it's, I think, in some ways, a, a painful kind of realization that Navajo archaeology only really started to change um, because of this work. Um, but basically, the, the Fruitland coal gas projects and the um, CRM surveys associated with them identified thousands of early Navajo sites in the Dineta region. And the greater familiarization with and interaction with increasing numbers of these sites, both Pueblitos, uh, regular everyday habitation sites, and then more specialized sort of activity or, or special use sites. Um, uh, they, they became the focus of modern archaeological research. Um, in particular, people started rolling out different kinds of methodological approaches, different technological approaches, including um, tree ring dating or dendroarchaeology at, at, a, at a larger scale. Um, and dendroarchaeology is, I, I call out here in part, because it was increased uh, identification of and subsequent dating um, of early Navajo sites that showed that um, through direct dating showed that the classic material culture mar markers of the refugee hypothesis, the Pueblitos and the painted pottery and the maize agriculture, these things that were thought to have been brought by Pueblos and sort of gifted or to or stolen by Navajos were actually, they don't fit that 1690 window. It turns out that their Pueblitos are 50 years later. Gobernador polychrome seems to happen 50 years before. And you find evidence for uh, corn or maize production at the earliest dated Navajo sites from the 1540s. So things are a lot more complex. And um, the recognition of this uh, spurred archaeologists um, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s to, to think more critically about the role that these defensive sites play in early Navajo lifeways and community organization. Um, and, you know, this is in the, the quotes around V is, is a call out to the structure of the Fruitland research design, which because there's so much work going on across a large region um, by different companies and different uh, groups, 
um, there was a sort of regional research design that was rolled out to which groups had to uh, adhere. And at its core, this research design asked questions about chronology and subsistence and uh, social organization, uh, trade exchange, et cetera. And coming by the, by the early 2000s and, and early 20 teens, what we started to realize was that um, a lot of, at least in the terms of Pueblitos, a lot of the Pueblitos, as I said, were being built not in the 1690s, but the vast majority, essentially all but three and one, only one is most likely linked to a, a refugee population. Of the other 140 some, they're being built in a short period between the 1710 teens and uh, oh, 1760 or so. And they don't seem to be tied to a sort of post revolt Pueblo influx, but rather seem to be a, a localized response to raids by Utes, Comanches, uh, New Mexican folks during the early mid um, 1700s. Um, in particular, right, the, this, this defensive aspect is, is quite, quite clear. Many of the sites are intervisible, creating kind of networks um, that seem to offer local Deneth family groups um, within the canyon systems, um, both safe spaces, but then also potentially spaces for a range of other activities as well, ranging from simple storage to larger, um, more involved kind of activities like ceremonies or, or potentially even serving as trade or, or, or um, sort of centers for, for leadership, right? It, some people will often say, right, that uh, Santa Fe is the, the northernmost extent of like, um, East Asian goods that come into the New World from from um, via the Manila Galleon and into sort of New Spain and come up, but actually the as best I can tell, one of the early or one of the furthest uh, northern northernmost examples of Chinese porcelain actually comes from Three Corn Pueblito. Um, so there's these 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 communities are linked into these regional and local networks in really fascinating ways. Um, and this this talk about networks then also uh, brings up another point, and one that's sort of at least kind of slightly hidden, uh, at least in how I've presented this, but it needs to be acknowledged is that uh, Pueblitos aren't just present in Denetra. Um, Dorothy Kerr's work at Big Bead, Big Bead is in the Rio Puerco, um, and in the 30s and 40s, people had noted that there were Navajo defensive sites in Chaco Canyon on Chaco Mesa as well. Um, and uh, in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, the, the uh, work um, by archaeologists uh, working for the Navajo Nation in support of the Navajo, of the Indian land claims projects, identified hundreds of sites both on and off the reservation. Um, and so as we work through this, there's now an, a greater appreciation for the fact that there are beyond Denetza, beyond that sort of initial cluster of sites up here in the Denetza region, there are defensive sites, Pueblitos, um, that are spread throughout the other parts of the Four Corners um, associated with Navajo occupation. It seems to be at least 40. Um, and they, they uh, like the Pueblitos and Denetza, they consist of various sort of forms. They're sort of true structures, true buildings, as well as naturally defensive landforms and, and the like. And the challenging part is that many of these are very poorly dated, um, either because they're found via survey or, or because they don't have a lot of material uh, present at the sites to date. And as a result, there's very little research at them that can help us understand how they're tied into these larger discussions uh, about Navajo history and movement and, and, and the like during the 17, 1800s. And so for me, this, this, uh, this realization, the more I've, I've worked with um, uh, various kind of Navajo historical topics and themes has, has drawn um, uh, increasingly greater amounts of my attention. 
um, in part because I think this is a really fascinating outgrowth of, of, of kind of Navajo responses to uh, New Mexican or Spanish colonization in the region during the 16 and 1700s. Uh, and as I started thinking a little bit more about this, well, I was offered through Arc Southwest a really kind of unique opportunity to, to start to explore this in greater depth. Uh, last summer, um, I worked with Paul Reed of Arc Southwest to conduct a cultural landscape inventory assessment of the Navajo occupation of Chaco Canyon. And it highlighted that, you know, in an area that has a very long uh, Navajo occupation from the 1720s earlier probably all the way to effectively the present day there have been Diné people centered in Chaco um, in addition to hogans and and you know everyday kind of you know special uh, everyday sites and special use sites you also see defensive structures like the dollhouse site on the left uh, Rafael's Rincon kind of fortified knoll on the right and even sites that seem to be slightly misidentified um, the one that uh, Paul is standing next to for scale is a, a site that was described as a as a square hogan, yet it sits at the foot of a um, spring and overlooks one of the main pathways into Chaco from the north. And I wrote a little bit about this in a preservation archaeology blog post for Arc Southwest, if you're curious. But this experience uh, really kind of jump started my interest, and so over um, over winter break in, in December and January of this year, I, I tried to do a little bit more and ended up actually traveling, gathering information about more of these uh, Pueblito sites and traveling out to a few of them. Um, and sort of just to run through them, this is uh, Kinejina, which is out near Clagato. Um, it was identified, it was, it, it's been known since the late 1800s, um, and in its current state now, there's only one story left, but in its prime, when the Mindeleff brothers uh, photographed it in the 1880s, I believe, um, or maybe 1860s, uh, it had uh, two stories standing as well as a third, you know, two, almost three story room off of one side. And as you can see, there's a, there's a Hogan ring here and there's evidence for other sites in the back, including fork stick Hogan's. Um, there's another Pueblito in the Chinle Valley near the community of Naslini, um, situated on a crag in Naslini Canyon, that again is, is six rooms. And this was identified during the uh, Navajo land claims as well, um, and was tested uh, and tree ring dates indicate that it dates to the 1750s. Um, as part of this trip in January, I also made it, had an opportunity to travel out to visit some of the Pueblitos that were reported near Sanasti. Um, and you can see the sort of the most well-known one here in the foreground on top of these boulders that overlook kind of the main, uh, the main um, sort of path up the wash towards so the Sonaste community. But one of the things, unexpected things that came out was that there are two more uh, sort of defensive type sites up in the main Sonaste community in these cliffs that overlook the area. And at least around this near site here, we found Gobendor polychrome, as well as Dineta gray pottery and, um, and maize cobs, all of which suggest a really kind of fascinating, oh, early, mid 1700s occupation of the Chuska slope, which is accompanying stuff that we see in Dineta. Um, also, we're able to visit uh, the lower Chacawash Poblito site which was identified by the, um, the Lower Chaco uh, Gas Project surveys in the 70s. And it's fascinating because this, this report, which resulted in a, it's an, almost an inch and a half thick and 600 some pages, the, the section um, describing Navajo sites is 20 pages, 24 pages. And this is one of them, this massive defensive wall that blocks off a, a finger of the mesa behind which you find a room block and several Hogan rings um, and the Chaco uh, River is in the background. It is only, oh, 20 miles distant from uh, the Sanosti cluster and in and of itself is, oh, what, 30, 40 miles downstream from Chaco Canyon. 
Uh, we also learned about a pueblito in Biclavato, which, strangely enough, you know, like unlike the others, it's it's in the north, and it actually that's Ute Mountain and Mesa Verde in the background, right? The orientation of this uh, structure, which is indicated with the arrow here, um, suggests that it's protecting communities, the net communities in this area as well, most likely from uh, raids and conflicts with Utes. Um, to the north. Um, and last, potentially, uh, and potentially the most interesting, we came across a, um, another defensive site in the Chusca Mountains uh, near Mexican Springs in Tohatchi. And the key takeaway here is it's not a formal structure, it's dry stack stone on these areas. But, and while there's no date, there's incredible potential because this is a 15 foot fur, step fur ladder that has never been sampled. And while the outer face is weathered, the, the rear is absolutely pristine with bark and beetle galleries and everything that one might hope for to get a, uh, a tree ring date to help better understand what this site, um, or sorry, where this site is situated in time. And as a whole, one of the things that's been exciting to, to think about a bit is how does this new information shift our thinking about Pueblitos and their role in Navajo society during the 18th and potentially even 19th centuries? And to sketch some things out, one of the things I've been looking at is, you know, it, they're, they're defensive. And we do know that there's a history of raiding back and forth between Navajos and um, the folks of, of colonial New Mexico. And I've just mapped out here a few kind of known or extrapolated uh, uh, expeditions, I should, should say, um, by or, or areas of transit or paths taken by by different groups uh, during the during this period. And there's some really interesting overlaps between site site locations, and um, and they offer us a, a way to start thinking more critically about the nature of defensive site use um, during this really kind of turbulent time. I guess, and so to take that point and expand on it a little bit, right? This is one of the things that I think is kind of fascinating. You know, there are a lot of kind of sacred cows of uh, Navajo archeology, span anthropology in general, and they come often from um, early, early ethnography, early, early archaeology, early types of research. And one of these is, you know, when you look at uh, Nib Hill's 1930s study of Navajo warfare, he clearly says that no type of fortification was employed. But as I've tried to show, there's definitely a, a history of uh, defensive site creation and use throughout the, throughout the larger Navajo world for a while. We don't know exactly how long, and I think that's a you know a really fascinating point to dive into. But one of the things to think of is that you know, or do we perhaps see a, a trend, a transition from sort of truly formal structures to more expedient or kind of natural defenses? Uh, a lot of the accounts from the Long Walk period that talk about the Navajo strongholds actually are referring to places like in Canyon de Chez, the Navajo fortress or Navajo stronghold, which is a a bluff in, in the canyon um, or a kind of high points on mesas. Uh, and I, I wonder to what degree increased research sh sort of shorn of this kind of refugee baggage and, and acculturative baggage can help us start to poke at these broader trends. You know, what's going on here? Is this indicative of questions about lifeways, uh, you know, larger political machinations, uh, influences of technology or, or, or something else? Um, I think these are really interesting questions. And I, you know, I, I find some inspiration in this from the work of uh, John Welch and others in, in, um, in Apache land, you know, down south along the Mogollon Rim, where we see a, a Western Apache tradition of building uh, fortresses and strongholds throughout the, the White Mountains and Salt, Salt River Canyon region. Um, 
And I'm wondering if there might not be kind of interesting parallels for, for comparison and, and thinking more critically about these. Okay, so thinking more critically, this is part two. Um, how am I doing for time? All right, oh, right on track. All right, so part two, um, thinking more critically about things, rethinking things. Um, what I'd like to sort of suggest to wrap up is what is the potential of a uh, archaeology? And this is a, a, a reference to some of the work that's been put forward by the, the now archaeologist or Merrick Martinez at NAU. Um, but in what ways can a Dine archaeology, this, this phrase that I just said is, is the way formally, technically, that Dine people understand ourselves. And that's what this is what separates us from other forms of, of, of people in this world, and that we are the five fingered earth people. Um, in particular, looking at the meme, Navajo tacos aren't the same as Indian tacos. I would venture that Pueblitos aren't the same as Pueblitos. Um, and how can thinking about these defensive structures through a specifically the NAF framework help us to uh, engage in that sort of transformative thought-making process and take things in a different direction? And at least for me, I see this very much in line with the the the, the missions and teachings of the indigenous archaeology movement, right? This idea of doing archaeology with, for, and by native communities, um, by encouraging native-led research, or by collaborating truly with native people. Um, one of the things that comes out of that, right, is, is an interest in native epistemologies, native understandings of history, uh, native terms and definitions as a way to understand the way in which uh, past peoples who have connections to contemporary communities um, would have understood what archaeologists are fiddling with half the time. And I think this is important because in doing so, we can challenge traditional narratives like the refugee hypothesis. And, and, and as Native people, uh, as collaborators uh, or as Native collaborators, right, work to take ownership uh, or have Native communities take ownership of their histories and, and, and provide these kind of tangible links between the past and the present. And, and in this, I've, I'm particularly uh, inspired of late by um, all the other Diné academics and, and, and you know, knowledge holders that are talking about this, sharing this, um, both in kind of um, in collaboration with uh, non-native folks, um, both in terms of, of of kind of traditional academic literature, uh, but also even um, more literary means, more community-driven means. Like leading the way is a, is a community newsletter that's published once a month on the res. You can buy it at gas stations. You can anybody can contribute. Um, you know, the Dene Reader is an assortment of like thirty some. Uh, Diné writers, poets, uh, and the like, and and Lloyd Lee has been a huge force uh, in and within the framework of Native American and Indigenous studies, kind of having Diné specific frameworks towards uh, discussions of land and identity and uh, kind of belonging, uh, particularly in this kind of past present um, framing. And so for me, one of the things that I've been thinking about then is it revolves around this question of, well, how did Diné people in Dinetka and elsewhere refer to these pueblitos when they were in active use? And this took the most recent uh, step, or I took the most recent step of actually trying to crowdsource through social media um, the Nebizad terms for fortress or stronghold or defensive place. Uh, you can see a screenshot of my uh, attempt on Facebook. Um, and I got some really interesting responses. And you'll note that none of these include Pueblito, the little New Mexican Spanish for you know small, small house, small building. But um, a lot of people suggested Bejolzil, which is a strong place. Um, the old Young and Morgan dictionary suggested Yariklin, which is uh, things piled up as a reference to a masonry tact uh, tower. Um, and there's other, other, um, other terms as well. And I think 
this sort of information starts to move us in a really interesting new direction. Um, and I suppose at this point, the question then becomes, you know, is it, well, what do we do? To Pueblito or not to Pueblito, to Bejotzil or to not Bejotzil? It, it's a bad Shakespeare ripoff, but right, that is the question here. Um, and I suppose there are arguments against making any sort of change, right? Pueblito is a relatively well-known Southwest kind of technical term. If you submit a site report to uh, the New Mexico arms site database, you have an option to indicate that a site is a Pueblito, a Navajo Pueblito specifically. Um, and in that, right, people might say that, you know, using Pueblito isn't negatively impacting anyone or anything. And um, I'm sure there's a whole host of folks that are probably thinking along the lines of, oh, my God, you know, terms of the deposit are too hard to pronounce. And I would agree with you there. But at the same time, you know, we don't have any problem generally trying to have a go at Spanish or French or German. So what makes this so different? And I think to me, there are some very strong arguments for considering a, a sort of definitional change as, as a step towards something larger. Um, I've encountered firsthand trying to introduce people to early Navajo archaeology and immediately run into the roadblock of these are Pueblitos. Oh, wait, wait, wait. These are Pueblo sites? And it's like, no, they're not. A woman gave them this name in the 40s and it stuck. And <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. Um, and so it creates this weird linkage that um, that I think kind of puts an immediate kind of stumbling block in the way of larger discussions. And um, I think that an alternative the net derived term can can start to spur us in interesting new directions, uh, get us to consider um, the role of defensive sites and and you know different types of interactions between 18th, 19th century Southwestern communities in new ways. Um, and I think one of the, the larger arguments in, in, in support of this actually is that, you know, a, a Denebizod term would offer a path towards um, promoting greater awareness about this aspect of Dene history within the community. Um, and I think to that end, right, this is from 1997, this is a, the site I mentioned near Klagato, Kinejene. And um, it was documented by the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department and using student, uh, using, uh, student volunteers from Ganado High School. They recorded the site. And one of the things they recorded was that people were, they didn't view the site as, as, as the net. They viewed it as, as, as a different kind of place by and large. Uh, and, um, an older kind of Anasazi settlement. And as a result, people were uh, indirectly or in some cases directly contributing to its um, destruction. And I think that partially this is due to a lack of discussion about these types of sites and their role in Diné history um, by and large. And I think that doing work to start changing the way that we talk about them can change the way that we think about them and share information about them that can help to kind of um, encourage the goal of, of cultural preservation um, that is really so central to the work of Archaeology Southwest, but also, you know, Native communities in general and archaeologists in general um, and all the folks that are here on this Zoom with me. So. Thank you. I look forward to hearing uh, what questions you might have. Um, you can track me down over the next few months if you want. I'll be back in the Southwest this summer uh, if you um, feel like talking more. Um, but yeah, in conclusion, my thanks again. Um, thanks again to my, my family, my friends, Richard Begay, Kellen Throgmorton, Leonard Perry in particular for accompanying me to these various defensive sites in January. Um, this was all done under a Navajo Historic Preservation um, site visitation permit. 
Um, and also I'm very thankful to Paul Reed for bringing me on to the Arc Southwest uh, Chaco work, as well as Dennis Gilpin, Clara Kelly, um, and John Welch for filling my questions about defensive sites in general, um, at least in this kind of Apache navigable context. So uh, yeah, thank you. I'll get out of the screen share and we can we can do some questions. Thank you so much, Wade. Those. That was so great. So I invite um, people in the Zoom, um, you can put some questions in the Q&A box and, and we'll do our best to answer some of these before uh, we end the, end the show tonight. And uh, just thank you so much, Wade, for that talk. It was so, so informative. So let's see what we got here. We have a question asking about kind of the processes that allow or, or disallow from, uh, for, for developing long lasting relationships and collaboration to occur um, because of grant processes. So mm. um, kind of wanting your thoughts just in general on, 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 your, on how you foresee that changing um, as these systems are already kind of preset. Yeah. Um, I think that the argument that collaboration might stall because grant programs don't allow for the development of trusting relationships is in some ways, and, and that, that other processes are, are needed beyond the kind of grant project infrastructure to allow for that, I think is in some ways a, a, an easy out. I don't necessarily think that's the case personally. I think collaboration isn't just shouldn't just occur in the framework of a grant right i think a grant is part of a larger project and um you don't apply for a grant without developing the project and you don't develop a project without talking with people first so i think that to say that a grant framework doesn't encourage collaboration is in some ways a little disingenuous because you should already be doing this within the framework of your project. So I think that in some ways it's, it's the, the timing might not fit, but that I think gets away from the, the larger discussion of sort of what is collaboration or what is sort of true collaboration and what should that look like? I think, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're working a grant, um, maybe the timeline's short uh and you maybe you take the lead right but that should all be discussed in terms of a phone call or a, an email exchange i don't see there's necessarily a reason why collaboration shouldn't be happening yeah well said thank you um we've got a few more coming in um here's one asking about um your thoughts on Dene clan names coming from Pueblo villages before the 1670s or earliest understood Navajo occupation. Yeah, so I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, <laughs> and this is not necessarily the time or the place to voice them. I would um, encourage you to, to look to Claire Kelly and Harris Francis's excellent um, 2019 U of A press book, A Dene History of Navajo Land. Um, the first two chapters do a really excellent job of stating the kind of ongoing argument for a, a more critical evaluation of the ancestral Southwestern world. And I think that for me, at least, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of the early Navajo clan names refer to places and things that are rooted in the four corners, but a lot also relate to um, a lot also relate to uh, uh, folks that are moving around. And I would say two things. One, Southwestern archeology span as a whole is very bad at dealing critically with mobility in larger sort of critical discussions of mobility, interactions between mobile and sedentary peoples and the recognition that mobility happens on a spectrum. In that, there's questions about mobile peoples that need to be addressed uh, more thoughtfully for the Chacoan period, uh, for other you know periods of time. I, you know, the the fact that um, 
archaeologists sort of once there's this sort of basket maker p1 transition archaeologists really haven't discussed the possibilities of mobile populations um, in the same way that they do archaic or sort of uh, proto-historic historic period groups yet we know from the archaeology that they're definitely present before and the spanish <laughs> note them in 1540 is definitely being present and so I don't think there's some sort of imaginary void that is existing for 1400 years. Um, and I think that these discussions of mobility and people coming together of different communities coming from different uh, organizations or different societies and making um, new groups isn't something that's unfamiliar. And so for me, Diné is all of that. Diné is an ancestral Southwestern component the net is uh, of, of which that ancestral component includes village dwellers, includes more mobile people, and it includes Athabascan speaking mobile people as well. And I think, you know, you look at something like this, nobody has any issue with this. Mobility is a part of that story and people are okay with it. And so in the case of early Navajo archeology, span understanding kind of Navajo origins maybe it's time to sort of shift away from origins and maybe look at actually kind of complexity and the role of different communities within that in these earlier time periods. Thank you. Yes, I, I appreciate that answer. Um, I have some questions about the dating, dating of the Pueblo, mm. Pueblo um, and and especially because they were constructed over a short time. So people were kind of asking about that. Yeah, so most of the Pueblitos, at least in Demetra, were dated um, at various points in time, but it, there was a huge sort of flurry of activity uh, during the Fruitland uh, work period, um, especially thanks to the work of uh, Ron Towner at, at U of A, um, who as part of his dissertation and, and, and subsequent work has really um, focused on trying to date uh, Pueblitos through dendro um, sampling of the architectural timbers at those sites. However, one of the challenges is that uh, um, one of the challenges that not all sites preserve timbers to the same degree appropriately for tree ring dating, um, and not all sites have have timbers even in, in the first place, and so this is a huge challenge and a big question and something that I've been kind of mulling over. And I wonder, I've been inspired by work that's been going on in, in other parts of the US in particular, um, where people are working, are, are revisiting sort of proto-historic or early colonial sites using AMS and putting it into conversation. You know, I think in the Southwest, we kind of hold Dendro up on a pedestal and it's excellent, but not every sample cross dates. Not every sample gives us a date even. And even when it does give us a date and cross dates or cross dates and gives us a date, it might not be a cutting date and it might not actually um, relate to the occupation in question. And so um, I've been a lot more curious about trying to bring modern AMS dating back into the mix um, in, in combination with uh, uh, with continued tree ring studies. Um, and I guess as a note on that, one of the things in particular is that a lot of the early Navajo, a lot of the Navajo sites that were dated uh, by the land claims or earlier projects, um, Southwestern archeologists didn't date Juniper before 80s, 90s maybe. There was a preferential focus on pine because pine dates a lot more easily than Juniper. But the issue is that juniper is a lot harder and more suitable for building um, certain types of structures than pine. And so you get these things where uh, they may have only taken one sample from a site if that was the only if there was only one suitable pine timber. So there's a lot of questions that uh, revolve around these or these early sites. And um, my own preference for avoiding excavation, <laughs> means that some of this might be a little tricky, but I think that it doesn't preclude the possibility of getting um, 
of starting to address this issue by harnessing a variety of different techniques. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're getting kind of late into the evening and I want to let everyone go about their evening, but um, I have a nice one at the end here about um, your students and, and what about this semester of, of, of your class and your students um, gave you hope for this project and for this work that you've, you've undertaken? Um, you know, this, uh, what gave me hope was, well, two things. One, um, this was my first time teaching a, now uh, an indigenous archeology span class <laughs> in part because, um, you know, I myself never had that sort of class. You know, I've done this work. I've had my own interests. They're, they're motivated by my own background, by my own reading, but I never had anybody walk me through ideas about working with indigenous communities or thinking critically about what it might mean to harness indigenous epistemologies or ways of knowing, right? Yet there's a whole, there's, you know, since I started in archaeology, there's been an increasing growth in terms of people writing about this, talking about it. Um, you know, this is a beautiful book uh, by the edited volume. Um, that came out in uh, 2020, I believe, Archaeologies of the Heart by uh, Keisha Supernat and others, you know, and, and they they get into these themes. And so the students gave me hope in that I was able to introduce them to things and kind of hear their thoughts and opinions on these ideas of arguments for collaboration and kind of ethical archaeological practice, um, you know, theoretical frameworks, methodological approaches that are rooted in things other than a sort of traditional top-down kind of dogmatic Western science approach. And they were open to it. They asked a lot of questions. Um, and not all of them were archaeologists even, which was, I think, a really wonderful thing. Um, you know, so there's a lot of cross-pollination. Um, and I think that's something that is really useful for the kind of work that we try to do. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Wade. This was just such a lovely event. And uh, I will invite uh, Linda to come back on and, and we'll let her say a few words and then we'll we'll be done for the evening. So thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, Sarah and Wade. Thank you so much. This has been just fascinating, very interesting. You gave us a lot to think about. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And uh, your buddy Paul was there watching. So just FYI. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody who's still with us for um, coming to the Archaeology Cafe se this season. Um, I think it's been a really wonderful, thought-provoking, challenging, um, and important season. And I know that those of us at Archaeology Southwest have um, learned a lot and given a lot to think about and try to um, better apply in what we try to do around here. So um, we've really valued this. So thank you so much. Um, Sarah is busy, hard at work, plotting for next season's cafe. And um, we'll we'll let you know what that's gonna be when we have that pinned down. And if any of you are out there and who are not on our email lists and things like that, and wanna make sure you hear right away about the next season's cafe, um, just go to our website and at the bottom of the page there, there's a way to sign up for the newsletters and things and you can keep informed about um, next season's cafe and all of our programming and stuff. But thank you again, Wade, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, and I'll let everyone go enjoy their evening. So good night. Thanks.